We are in the Gospel of John, continuing through our series of the Gospel of John. We are in John chapter 17. We'll be reading verses 20 through 26. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are chair Bibles and every other chair in front of you, and it is on page 903 in the chair Bible. Or you can go to viachurch.org slash guide, and that'll have the notes that were on the bulletin and guide that you received on the way in, as well as the biblical text so you can follow along as we read. So also, if you don't have a Bible at home, let's say you're leaving today and you go, I just really wish I had a Bible at home, or I wish I even had an ESV Bible at home. We have a complimentary Bible that we would love to put into your hands. You can stop by the Info Center. It's across the courtyard. Um, Stop by the Info Center and ask them for that complimentary Bible, and they will give that to you, and then you'll be able to read the text over in the course of the week and be able to take it in. Um, If you'd please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. I'll read and you can follow along. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, And you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. So God, as we, as we read these words, and we recognize that your word is living, and it is active, and it pierces our heart, it convicts us of sin, and it drives us closer to you, I pray right now that these words will continue to change us and to transform us into the people that you would have us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. We have been going through the Gospel of John now for over a year. Our plan is to wrap up by Advent time. And um, we have been looking last week and this week at what is called Jesus' priestly prayer. Um, It comes at the end of this farewell discourse. Jesus is, uh, John is writing, and he's writing so that people believe, and he's showing the belief and unbelief of people. Then he's showing the belief of the disciples, unbelief of Judas. Uh, They are gathered around uh, the Last Supper, and Jesus has been giving instruction, and most of his instruction is preparing them to take on the mission to which he has dedicated himself to, and that is the redemption of the world, to take on this message of Jesus and carry on the work of Jesus after he is gone. He's preparing them for his death. And as you read through his teachings and the disciples' responses, there's moments that you go, the disciples, they're getting it, they're getting it. Nope, they don't have it. Okay, they got it, they got it. They don't have it. And, and I just, I'm always reminded that that's sort of the way we are, right? There's moments we really get this. There's moments we really understand it, and then there's other times we misunderstand it or just totally misses us. And so we see that in there. So Jesus has given them uh, chapters of instruction, and then he lifts his, his eyes towards heaven and begins to pray. And he prays for these immediate disciples. He prays for himself. He's consecrating them and, and commissioning them, and then... Uh, So as we looked at that last week, we looked at uh, the requests that Jesus had, and that was that there be unity among his disciples. We talked about how the the enemy of our soul, the enemy of God's people, the devil, he's always trying to sow strife among God's people. It was already happening among the disciples, even at the Last Supper. They were 
pining for who was going to be first and greatest in the kingdom. We talked about sanctification, being set apart, being made holy by the work of Jesus, that we are made holy not by trying, but by the work of Jesus, and we simply have to walk in it. And then, uh, then we also talked about uh, how he prayed that his followers would carry on his mission. So we sort of, I sort of chose, and we chose to keep these last verses of this prayer sort of separate because the remainder of Jesus' prayer continues the same theme. It, it can almost sound like he's just sort of repeating things, but it's much more specific focus. But one of the things I just want us to sort of look at first is that Jesus prays for us. Because look, look what it says in verse, verse 20. I do not ask only for these, like my disciples that are right here at the table with me, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. It's powerful to be prayed for. Um, When I think about people that have prayed for me or are consistent in prayer, there's there's so many, and and so many of you, thank you for that. I I remember in 2005, my my grandma passed away, my mom's mom, and uh, I actually have a picture of of her here, and uh, grandma passed away in 2005, and um, this is is a birthday party for our kids in our basement. We were living in Milwaukee, and we, I guess we did face painting. We all got one. You see that? My grandma's right there in the middle. It's sort of cool. So our kids are there, um, and then uh, my parents in the upper left, Susan's parents upper right, um, and then uh, that's my grandma and her husband. Uh, my grandma uh, was a woman of faith. Um, that is actually her third husband. The first two husbands passed away from cancer, and the first wedding I ever did as a minister was her marrying Dan, which is a lifelong family friend. He had lost his wife. And so my first wedding I ever performed, I was like, so grandma, do you take him to be, oh, this is confusing, okay? And, uh, but uh, she got married at seven years old and they, they uh, sh- until she went along another 16 years. So they were married 16 years to her third marriage uh, before she passed away of a stroke. In fact, the day she passed away, she came to church, passed out bulletins and greeted people and wasn't feeling well and went home and passed away. So that's my grandma. And so I love that she went through massive heartache. She was a widow at 23 years old and a widow again at 59 uh, and a widow, unmarried widow for 13 years and then remarried. So some of you are like, oh, there's hope for me. Yeah, there was. Grandma just kept going. Uh, we teased her that she killed them all off. Um, but <laughs> but grandma, grandma knew the Lord and she would pray. And especially as I started ministry, I just knew every single day she took me before God in prayer. When she passed, I think probably one of the biggest things that hit me was that she wasn't doing that anymore. Like I I had to work through what that was like to wake up and go into ministry and and I knew she wasn't praying for me anymore. Her prayers have meant a ton to me. I I think about another person that uh, prays for me often, he's still alive, and his name is George Dirksen. George is a Canadian. Um, This is me and George in May this year. Uh, I went up to Winnipeg and spoke for him. He's got a massive passion to share Jesus with people. He's a rancher. I always tell him he looks like he's trying to be Columbo or something. I don't, and so, uh, but George, um, George prays for me and he calls me quite often. Um, and if he if he calls me and I don't answer, um, he prays a long prayer on my voicemail. And but I love to hear. George pray. When, when I pick up the phone, George always says the same thing. Is this the mighty man of God? And I have different answers for different days um, of how I'm feeling. And, but as he, as he prays, and he always calls me Ricky and Susan Susie, that's reserved for him and not you. And, um, but here's the, he does this prayer, and I tried to write it down. He's prayed it over me really for about 17, 18 years that I've known George. But this is the prayer that he prays. Father, I pray that you would give Rick the faith of Abraham, the courage of David, the strength of of Samson, the wisdom of Solomon, and the mind of Christ. And when he prays that, I always choke up. It's been years, and every time he prays it, I choke up on the phone, and I thank him for, prayer, for praying for me. He's now, I think, 85, 86 years old, walks with a walker, and he has spent his fortune that he made in publishing 
on getting God's word into the hands of people. And I was there helping to raise money with him in May. But when George prays, something happens inside of me. I just, I feel something that there is this care and a power and a sustaining presence around me that um, I'm made aware of through his prayers. It's powerful to be prayed for, isn't it? It's power to be powerful to be prayed for. I could have gone on for a list of so many other people that pray that just do something. Those are two thoughts immediately. If you go, who's prayed for you? My grandma and then George Dirksen still prays for me. Jesus prays for us. He, and and if, you're, if you're a Christian today, this is this prayer that he prays that, that he didn't only pray for his disciples there, but he prayed for all of us who will believe in him through their word. If you're a Christian today, it is because there has always been a community of faithful believers broadcasting the truth of Jesus to the world, both in word and in deed, until it was passed down to our generation. You should marvel at that for a moment. A couple of thousand years, followers of Jesus have received the, the, the testimony of Jesus, they've received the, the story of Jesus, and by faith they've received the forgiveness of Jesus, they've received his spirit, and then they are compelled to share that same story through testimony, through word, through proclamation, through action with Others and generation after generation are serving Jesus, and I believe it's a result from Jesus' prayer right here. He prays. This is why I believe we have to be faithful to the next generation. I, I, so there are some times as a pastor, and I've watched ministry and society and uh, the the place of the Christian faith within society in America, and I've seen things change, and I sometimes, as a pastor, fear that previous generations were maybe better at understanding their responsibility to the next generation than we are. I fear that at times. There was an understanding of legacy at times, and and, and, and investing and, and seeing something bigger than themselves and seeing something that would live on beyond the years that they were on this earth to make sure that there was proclamation of the gospel, that the path was laid for future generations. We have a whole generation. We, we talk about boomers and Gen X and millennials, but there's one whole generation called the builders. I mean, they just like built systems and they built our postal services and they built these systems to sort of serve. They saw something beyond themselves and 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 we have been so saturated in a self-serving uh, uh, sort of hedonist kind of society that we are we aren't seeing that responsibility we don't feel that like we other people have felt we we have so much swam in the waters of consumerism that we see church through what it gives us that it's a provider of services rather than a family and a community of faith in which we must invest for future generations generations to come along. This is why I unashamedly challenge us as a community of faith and I, to give to things like Project Hope, to say, hey, let's lay, let's lay foundation. Let's, let's do something for generations that maybe we will never personally benefit from. But we lay a path that others could look and marvel that there were faithful people. So here Jesus prays and, and I really believe that we were in the mind of Jesus on that night when he prayed this prayer. He prays for unity again. Like a theme through this prayer, unity. That we might be one in the name of God. He talks a lot about he's, that he, he communicated the name, he protected them in the, in the name of God, and that he's, he's asking God, keep them in your name, and then he once again asks that we would be one in the name of God. And this is, this is something that we need to sort of see. He's, he's addressing them as Holy Father, that he wants us to be children of one Father 
that should live together as one family and one household of faith. There's a lot of family pictures and metaphors that are given to us here. And so the, the, this unity that we have is not just a reflection of the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the unity that Jesus is praying for us for is a participation in the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We participate in the perfect unity of Father, Son, and Spirit that they enjoy. We get to participate in that. It's, it's like if you could imagine three chairs, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and like a fourth chair for you and me is, is put in the circle and we are invited to participate in the perfection of relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a participation there. And as we participate in the, in the unity of Father, Son and Spirit, it gives us pictures of how we participate in unity among one another. And this unity is spiritual, but it also must be visible. Unity must be visible that others can see. Because what, what, he, what he says here in verses 21 and 23 is that the unity of, of followers of Jesus, look at verses 21 through 23, and 23, it will bring the world to believe and know the love of God, not just as a doctrine, but a palpable reality which holds believers together in spite of their human diversities. And so with the way we unify ourselves, the way we serve one another, the way, the way we relate to one another causes is what the world will see and believe and know the plan of God. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So also you also are to love one another by this. It always says there's a reason for this love. There's this missional reason for this love. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If this prayer at the Last Supper was the only prayer that Jesus ever prayed for us, we would still have great reason to praise him and marvel that we were on his mind. But here's the reality. He didn't just pray for us once. He ascended after his crucifixion. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and he continues to pray on your behalf and on my behalf. He's still praying for us. Look at Romans 8, 34 through 35. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who, look at what it says, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I mean, I, this, this is what comforted me as I lost my grandma praying for me every day. Jesus prays for me. He's a lot better than my grandma's prayers. I mean, she could pray. I mean, sometimes she would pray before a meal, and we had to pray around the world for missionaries, and the food got cold. She could pray, but Jesus is forever interceding for us. This is a marvel in a way that the one who would pay the substitutionary price that would satisfy the wrath of God destined to us. We, we sang this a couple of moments ago that he would make a wretch his treasure that he would treasure us. One of the things that I love about my grandma's prayers and George's prayers is that I feel their love for me when they pray. Like when George prays, he, he's calling me Ricky and Susie and he's praying and, and I, I feel love. Do you know when Jesus is interceding for you, it's full of love. Those of us that have adult children, we know what it is to pray for our kids. We know what it is to pray for them. We say things to God about our adult children we can never say to our adult children. Yeah, there's a few chuckles in the room, right? 
Because you're like, God, they don't see it yet, but I see it, and I know you see it, and they will see it. And we pray, and we lift them before God. And we're praying. We're praying for large things, big picture things. We're praying with this compelling, my son, my daughter, hear wisdom from God. Find life in God. There's, you're looking, we see them searching for life other places, and we're going, no, 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 life comes from God. But they've got to find out, and, and we, we, they, sometimes they're going to have to walk through pain, and they're going to have to come to the end of their rope, and they're going to have to, 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 to come to the place where they're at the end of themselves, and they reach out for God. Like, we know that, and we pray these kind of interceding prayers, and, and the prayers of a parent for children is powerful, and, and and that we have a Savior that prays for us. You, know, you have a Savior that's praying for you like that right now. He sees things you don't see. He sees things that you're blind to. He, he knows things that you don't know yet. And, and this one who would go to the cross for you is interceding before the Father. I just know, I can only imagine, like I, I, when I read George's prayer to you, some of you went, whoa, what a great prayer. Can you imagine Jesus' prayer? specifically for you. What do you think Jesus is praying for you for, about today? What do you think he's praying for you about today? Think about that for a moment. I, I love to think that thought. I, I walk early in the morning and sometimes I say, Jesus, what are you praying for me specifically for today? Because I'm praying, oh God, I'm going into this meeting, I need wisdom. Oh God, we've got a project going on, you gotta supply. Oh God, this person in the church, these things are going on in their life and I'm praying for them and I'm praying for my kids and I'm thinking about my day and I'm thinking about all, I'm praying all these things and, and somehow I'm sometimes convicted that Jesus' prayer is probably very different than mine. Sometimes I try to imagine Jesus going before God the Father and he says, Holy Father, I lift Rick up to you. And I, I'm intrigued to know what the blank is after that. Jesus, who knows all things, searches all things. What is he praying for for me? And I, I sometimes I, 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 try to, I try to pray into those prayers. God, that, that area of my life I just keep holding on to. I feel your conviction and I just, it's not that big of a deal, God. What is Jesus praying for you for today? Is he praying for your, your behavior and your marriage? Is he praying that you would trust him with the resources he's given you? Is he praying that you would learn generosity because he's been so generous to you? Is he praying that you would unchain your heart from the love of money and things and stuff that try to satisfy you? Or praying that you would see that these experiences and this great earth are, are wonderful and you're going after these experiences, but he wants to show himself to you and there's not enough experiences in this world that can fill the void in your heart like he can. Is he praying that you would be released from some idol in your life, some good blessing that he blessed you with and yet you hold it up and it's, the, it's your source of joy and it's your source of security? I could go on and on. What's Jesus praying for you for today? We have a savior who provided an opportunity, a blessing, an invitation to be adopted in to his family with his father. Look what the rest of the verse is saying. So I want to read that again. Who is to condemn us? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Probably mindful of the devil's schemes. 
Who, sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? I mean, they, right after Jesus is praying, then there's, that means nothing can separate you. Like you're secure in Jesus. Like the world is a pretty scary place to be, especially if you turn on the news. It's a pretty scary place to be. But if you're in Christ, it's a perfectly safe place to be because you have a Savior that raises your name before God Almighty, interceding consistently. I don't know how he prays for all of us individually at the same time, but he also spoke the worlds into being and it sort of happened. We serve a God who carries us through prayer and intercession. And I'm convinced that once we're in Christ and part of this kingdom and part of this kingdom family, that we could not bear life in the trenches of the kingdom without his intercession. Jesus prays for us to be where he is. Whoa, think about that for a moment. He says, God, I want them to be where I am. He's, he's made it really clear. I am going back to my father through death on the cross. I'm going back to my father. I'm going to, I will be with him in glory. And then he prays for us. He says, I want them to be where I am. Our kids live in the East Coast, and it's so fun to watch them in their young adult life, and careers, and relationships, and, and uh, a few times a year we get together. They were just with us, and we're going to see them again in a number of weeks, and, and but I, one of my, my favorite texts that I can ever get is when my kids go, we can't wait to be with you. Like, that's better than, like, hey, I can't wait to go do this fun thing with you. Like, I can't wait to be with you. Susan and I text throughout the day, and my favorite text is always, I can't wait to be home with you. Like, that just makes me go, oh, yeah, I like that. Like, right? When somebody says, I want to be with you. I can't wait to spend time with you. I can't wait to be with you. It's like the greatest thing someone can say to us. And here's Jesus going, I want them to be with me. He made a wretch his treasure. Like he treasures us. The, 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 the gospel of, of uh, 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 so here's Jesus' prayer now turns towards the end of all things. So he's given this incredible mission and that the world would know through them. And then when it's said and done, I want them to be with me. They are my treasure. And the gospel of John is always clear that the end of all things is a real future that Jesus looks forward to and the church should also look forward to. So here's, he's, he's reclined at the table with his disciples. Do you ever have that moment where you're at this great meal and the, you're, you're satisfied with the food and, and you love who you're with around the table and the lighting is just right and you're comfortable and you look around the table and you're like, I'm with my favorite peeps, man. I mean, this, this is where I like to be. And you want to like hold on to that moment. But then there's a certain moment where you're like, okay, let's load the dishwasher. But he's reclined at the table with his disciples and he offers this prayer. It's interesting, John doesn't do this, but in, in Mark 14 and Luke 22, at the same moment, at the Lord's table, Mark and Luke record that Jesus sees this last supper meal as a foretaste of the heavenly banquet where his followers would feast with him again. And so the other gospel writers, Jesus sort of looks at this and goes, this is, this is the way it's gonna be, guys. This, this, this moment of unity and feasting together is where we're headed. 
And his prayer in our text is that all who would believe would be with him and share his glory. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. Now, there's a reason. Look what it says. To see my glory. Now, I, I am just going to tell you, I don't know exact. I could never get the words to paint that. But there's this glory of Jesus. I mean, John's written about it over and over again, that the glory, this glory of Jesus is with him. There's this presence of who he is. There's this all oh, this wonder. And he goes, I want them to be with me because I want them to see something. I want them to see my glory, which you've given me because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Have you ever had somebody, you're with somebody, and you want them to see something that you've seen that they've never seen yet? This last uh, Memorial Day, um, we went up to visit Susan's family, and uh, Susan grew up about 30 miles uh, in a different suburb of Milwaukee than where I grew up, and I grew up in, 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 uh, from 10 years old on in this historical town called Cedarburg, and Cedarburg is like a destination spot. It's, it's a lot of little shops and stores and wineries and mills and crafts and art and chocolate. It's like a woman's paradise. And, and I, I mean, I grew up there. That's where I graduated from high school. I worked at a little antique, famous little gas station that's now a jewelry store. There's these, there's these uh, there's inns and bed and breakfasts. And, and so, but we, we don't normally get up to that part of town when we're visiting her family. But her family said, how about if we go up to Cedarburg for the day? I'm like, yes, I get to go home. It's my whole town. And like some of the mills that today are these shops, and they've been shops for years. When I was 10, 11, 12 years old, before those kind of shops were popular, I rode my bikes through those mills, and we played in the mills, like, and now they're shops. And so like those stairways, these wooden stairways from the 1800s, I'm like, I, I can go down that on a bicycle, at least I could at one day. And so like, so I was excited because we had all of our family. Susan's youngest sister has two little girls, Jewel and Treasure. Their picture's coming up. And this is, this is Jewel and Treasure. And they are just sweet little girls. And, and they, they were the youngest along. And I love to hang out with the kids. And so I'm with Jewel and Treasure. I'm like, this is where I grew up. When I was your age, like, this is where I grew up. And I'm going to show you things. And, and so we're walking through this, this one, the one store. And I knew, where I, like, I knew where I wanted to take them because I knew things that about that city that other people didn't know. I went through this one mill and I was talking to them. I gotta show you something, I gotta show you something. They're holding my hands. I went out and I went out to this thing that used to just be a patio, it's now a restaurant. People were out there eating, I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, I'm walking through this little like outdoor restaurant. I climbed over a little fence and then I wanted to show them this one spot. The next picture is coming up. I wanted to show them this waterfall area and I, and I, walk, I made them walk across a beam to get out to this little island. Go back one slide. And so we walk across, we walk across and we stand out there. Most people would never do this. I, cr I, did, I crawled a fence in an outdoor restaurant. It was a little weird. But I wanted them to see something because once you walk across this little plank across some water and then you get out to that little grassy area, the next picture you turn and right at this waterfall, you could see the glassiness. That's where I used to ice skate right there when I was a kid. I also used to drive my snowmobile to that spot. But I stood out there and we're standing out like on this island by a waterfall and I'm holding their hands. And it's sort of like, oh my gosh, I, you know, it, it's, it's a little weird that I'm standing out there. But it's a place that if you grew up there, you know that spot. And when they got out there, and then even some of the adults crawled out with us and everyone said, wow, because you just stand at that moment. This is just a little wow. I know it's not like wow, but it was wow, because you stand out there, and you're like, there's water all around us, and you stand here, and you get a, a picture of Cedarburg you can't get from anywhere else, the glory of that spot. I wanted them to see the glory of that spot. We know what that's like when we want somebody to do that, but here's the, the glory of Jesus that's been given to the, by the Father, and Jesus is going, I want them to be where I am because I want them to see something. I want them to see this glory, this wow, this presence, this awe, this, this thing that you have given to me because you've loved me before the foundations of the world. They, we are the creators. They are the created. And there's a glory that 
they have not yet seen. I mean, I just think for a moment the wonders of the world or the places we could stand in God's created order here on earth and go, wow. But can you imagine what this is? I think it's bigger than the Grand Canyon. I think it's more wow than pictures of the earth from space. This is the glory that God has given his beloved son. And Jesus says, I pray that they would be with me to see my glory. I don't know what it is, but I want to see. And I won't be there because I've been good enough or I've believed all of these right things. I will be there simply because of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's that I won't deserve to be there. I haven't earned my way to be there. I have got snuck in the back door of grace and given an incredible picture of something that so far the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have beheld and we have not. I don't know what it is. But if in his priestly prayer he prays, I want them to be with me to see the glory you have given me. And so we can't lose the whole vine and branches here. He, he's saying, I want them to be in me and I in them, just like I am in you and you are in me. And he's not only praying that we would be in him, but then he prays that we would be with him. There's no place in the universe I would rather be than to be in his presence. And incredibly, he also wants me to be with him. And our chief goal coming from scripture and these are lofty words that are very abstract but our chief goal from scripture is to glorify God and enjoy him forever to enjoy him forever this the greatest benefit of Christianity is not the forgiveness of sins The greatest benefit of Christianity is that we will have access to the presence of God and his son. The forgiveness of sins is simply the means to an end, that we would be with him. And so if if you've trusted Jesus to forgive your sins... But you, you, you stop there and never marvel at who Jesus is and know him and walk with him and commune with him and learn from him and seek him. If your goal was just to have your sins forgiven, you're stopping short of the goal. That's the, ends to the, me, the means to the end. The end is that you would know Christ. This is why Paul says, look, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of who he is through his suffering, through his resurrection. I want to know Christ. This is why weeks ago, I, in a moment of just, just maybe sheer, uh, 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 I don't know what emotion I was feeling, I just cried out to you and said, church, talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Commune with Jesus. He wants to be with you. He just doesn't want to make sure your sins are forgiven so that somehow, someday, you might be in the right spot. He wants you to know him now. He wants you to see his glory now. This is why you and I need to walk with him and we need to practice his presence. We have to tell ourselves, Jesus, you're here. Show us who you are. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me a little more today. Give me a glimpse of your glory. It's foretaste. Someday we will see him face to face. Someday the veil will be lifted. Someday the dark glasses come off and we see in full beauty and splendor and vividness the glory of Jesus but his glory can be held be beheld now by us through the power of the spirit of God and so I would tell you seek the presence of God in your life this is not just a Christian way of life a pray once and then you're sort of you're you're out you're now you're in and hey you're good for when you die there's something more Jesus wants you to be with him for eternity but he wants to meet you now and he's given you the spirit another helper we talked about that would come along and guide you into all truth and reveal to you the 
glory of who Jesus is. Know him and know him today. This doesn't come without prayer. This doesn't come out and come without practicing his presence in our homes and taking communion together and, and believing that God will show up when we call on him. God help us. Jesus wants us to be with him. And he went through all the pain and the suffering of the cross so that sins could be forgiven so that we could be with him. And this convicts me because there's times I go, I have a very busy day and I've got a lot of things on my calendar and it's booked back to back and I don't even have time to go to the bathroom sometimes. And yet Jesus wants me to be with him. And I get convicted. Jesus, how much have I acknowledged you today? How much have I recognized your presence with me? How much have I sought to see just glimpses of your glory today? How much have I prayed and thought about what you're praying for me and tried to live into what those prayers might be? And this just brings conviction on my life. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to know him in his glory. Just close your eyes for a moment, would you? What is Jesus telling you? What's Jesus telling you right now? Some of you right now, you're getting a few thoughts and they're not even complete. You don't know what to do with it. But I want you to just mark in your mind the words that are coming to your mind. Maybe it's obedience. I just sense that somebody's hearing the word obedience. And you have this right belief structure, but there's no obedience in your life. You're not obeying the word. You're not obeying what you know to be true. And I just want you to remember that obedience is what Jesus is talking to you about. someone's hearing the word busyness you filled your life and your calendar with just such busy stuff and you've not, you're not taking time Jesus wants to be with you and you've taken no time to be with him I sense that somebody is just hearing the word practices like your, your practices are just missing of prayer Communion in your home, scripture reading, fellowship with believers, talking about the things of God and the practices in your life are just missing. that someone's just sort of hearing that you're having a form of godliness but you're denying the power of the gospel in your life your life has this godly form but there's there's no power there's no presence of Jesus in your life and you're sensing that right now and you go I've got this form I'm living this Christian life but I, what we're talking about the glory of Jesus and pursuing him in prayer I, I, I just don't even have that and right now the, the spirit of God would just it's just calling you to have the power that's behind all this outward shell of Christianity. You've got the outward shell of Christianity. You're missing the power of the gospel in your life. Someone's hearing right now that you're just a lack of joy in your life. This is such a beautiful picture of joy and presence and 
togetherness and unity. And yet you're void of joy in the midst of an incredibly joyful gospel. And God wants to give you joy in spite of the circumstances that are less than ideal. He wants to give you joy right now. And, and, and that you're hearing this is a joyous message and I am so lacking in joy. And the Spirit of God wants to give you a joy, a deep understanding that in spite of circumstances that he has got you and he's interceding for you and he wants to restore the joy of your salvation. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Jesus, we lament our lack of faith. We believe, but Lord, help our unbelief. We lament that we run after and chase after idols that never satisfy, never fulfill. We lament that. We lament that our deeds as a community oftentimes fail to reflect the heart of our God. We lament it. But in great expectation, we confess our sin to you and ask, refresh us, refill us. God, do a new work in us. Bring new life in us. Awaken us from our spiritual slumber in the name of Jesus. Unite our hearts together in unity. And may we walk into the difficult situations of our lives with great confidence that you are with us and you carry us and you intercede for us and you desire to be with us. And the end of all things is a bright future because of the work of Christ. And we celebrate and revel in that. So God, hear our prayers. I know I just sense that there's been a lot of prayers and thoughts in this room in the last few moments directed by your spirit. Continue that deep work in us that we would become the people you'd want us to be not only individually but corporately. Do your good work in us. Be as we come to the table. This is an incredible celebration, what we're just talking about. The sacrifice, the body and blood of Christ given for us that we might commune, that's why we call it communion, commune with Jesus, that we might be with him. And a deep understanding of the Christian faith is that every time these elements are present, that there he is in the midst of us. The presence of Jesus is here as we partake in these elements. Would you recognize him? Would you pray together? Would you rejoice together for the presence of Christ both now and forever that we will enjoy via come, come celebrate the presence of Jesus.